Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Happy to see you here. Unfortunately, you all got the news that the library was closed yesterday, and the program is today on a Tuesday. So, thank you for reading your notices properly. Welcome to the 258th consecutive meeting of the Lexington Veterans Association. I'm Linda Dixon, and on behalf of the LVA, it's our pleasure to welcome you for uh, a wonderful program ahead with a World War I theme. Um, first thing we will do is uh, start the program with a thanks to um, Starbucks in Lexington Center. We've lost count of the number of years, we think it's 15, that they have provided complimentary coffee to help socialize and make our meetings so pleasant. And thanks to all the volunteers who bring the delicious baked goods. <clears throat> and thanks to everyone who drops a little something in the basket because we have no budget. That's our operating revenue and what small business expenses we have come out of that basket. Thank you. Um, let us now uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Jim Ramsey. Jim. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jim. Just a word about all the Veterans Day activities we had. Uh, there was a very strong veteran presence and a Lexington Veterans Association presence during the last week. And we were, we were thrilled with your participation, with your support, with the help that you provided. And um, I was just speaking with Peter Lund, one of our steady members, who attended all of, most if not all, of the events. And uh, he was a first-hand witness <laughs> and just had some, some comments to make ab about all the events. And I said, Peter, why don't you come up here and kind of be our reporter on the spot and give us a quick summary of your opinion of how it all went. So with that, Peter, come on up. So a lot of us were maybe intimately involved and others were just sort of on the perimeter of the whole uh, series of activities relating to the celebration of the end of World War, World War I. Um, the lectures were, in my opinion, were quite, quite phenomenal and the uh, ceremony and so forth on Sunday with the parade and the exhibits and everything else that went with it and the kids and their essays uh, and the uh, high school band and the whole nine yards. It really was, I think, a, a tremendous credit to the town and a tremendous credit to the organizations that were intimately involved. So that's my observations. I thought it was pretty neat. And gee, maybe it's a shame we have to wait another hundred years. I don't know. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Again, thank you. To, there were so many people in this room who attended, supported, and helped. Thank you. Um, Gresh Lattimore has been very busy working with Lexington High School and military recruiters, and he's done quite a bit since our last meeting, so he's going to just quickly bring you up to date. As I may have uh, said before, I've learned my lesson when you deal with Lexington High School, don't go from the bottom up, go from top down. So I went to the school committee and gave a little uh, two-minute talk that they allowed to the community to speak. And I said that uh, we wanted to honor those who were enlisting upon graduation. And also, we would like to understand the recruitment process. So uh, turns out our superintendent of schools, her dad, uh, was in the military and active in the VFW. Uh, so uh, as a result of that, uh, the woman in uh, guidance counseling, uh, Stacy Glickman, whom I had difficulty getting in touch with last year, 
now sent me an email and said, let's get together. <laughs> so we got together uh, with one of the, one of the two uh, assistant principals um, and <clears throat> the uh, outcome of that meeting was that on, let's see, January 14th, <coughs> the recruiters from Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard will meet with the guidance department and just lay out why, <coughs> if you're not off to Harvard or Yale, you might be off to the Navy. <coughs> and, or the Marines, or whatever. <laughs> but uh, there are alternatives to uh, going right into the military. So uh, I'm very, uh, uh, very happy that this is occurring. And uh, it's not that Lexington has closed the door to veteran recruitment, or, or uh, rather uh, 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 recruitment for, for new enlistees. It's just, I think it should have a little bit more of a, 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 purposeful, uh, a purposeful meaning. And I think by, by getting the guidance uh, counselors, probably none of whom have been in the military, don't know anybody in the military, can get an idea that, you know, that might be a legitimate option for somebody who doesn't want to go to Yale or Harvard. So I'll keep you advised. Thank you, Jim. Very encouraging. Uh, the Lexington Veterans Association has been developing a personal relationship with the high school, specifically with a history teacher who uh, teaches junior students. Uh, for the second year in a row, we have recruited uh, a small group of veterans to visit the high school and kind of sit on an informal panel and just talk to students about their military experience. This is voluntary for the students. They, they, they're not being dragged by the arm. And uh, to our great surprise, large numbers of students are showing up to uh, hear what these veterans have to say. So just last week, as part of our Veterans Day commemoration, uh, four veterans, one of whom is here today, Bob Pride, uh, four veterans were part of the panel, and it was really nice. So I thought, <coughs> I, I thought Bob would come up, say a few words about his personal experience being at the high school on this panel. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, the, uh, the panel was last week, and um, I, I, I attended, uh, with about 100 students there. Boys and girls? Yes, and uh, uh, you might not realize, but I, I represented the Navy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, uh, I spoke for about, five to six minutes, I, I guess, and uh, I tried to make a little pitch for ROTC because that's how I got into the military. And, uh, and so uh, we talked a, a bit about training, uh, my training that I had, and then uh, my experiences uh, on destroyers, as you might gather, um, uh, for uh, uh, maybe in, the, in my training, it was in the Mediterranean, and then uh, on active duty, it was in uh, uh, Westpac, and uh, so I made two cruises and, on ships in Westpac, and then uh, uh, I was uh, in Saigon for for a while. Um, and my my pitch was that uh, the Navy can change your life, uh, and uh, I thought they were very interested. Uh, they asked some questions, uh, and I I think it was uh, was beneficial. One reason I was willing to do it was that last year I was at the Carry. Uh, uh, Hall Veterans Day and, and uh, the teacher Mike Egbert uh, had some people there that talked to uh, some high school students so I, I thought it was well worthwhile. So it was, it was very interesting. Uh, I think uh, I was, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, kids don't have a lot of experience uh, but the essays that y you, you might have heard if you were there uh, the other day uh, talked about the relatives that they do have that have military experience or that they they learned about. So it was it was well worthwhile. Thanks. Uh, just double checking, Gina, Gina is not here, right? 
Okay, because if she was, I would ask her to come forward. All right. Does, does anybody else have an announcement or anything they would like to share with the group? If not, let us move on to the program. Let me introduce our speakers, Carolyn Kingston and Tony Tasker. Carolyn and Tony have known each other for years, but they had one thing in common that they never knew about until recently. They each had a grandfather who served in France in World War I, and each had asked many questions about their grandfather's time in France, which happened to be shrouded in mystery. Carolyn and Tony realized that the books, letters, photographs they had grown up with were vital clues to their grandfather's stories, and they set about following those clues. They received information from unexpected sources. They got some lucky breaks. They used their considerable research skills. They traveled to France. They met some amazing people. They had experiences they will remember for a lifetime, and they uncovered their grandfather's stories. Carolyn Kingston taught voice for 29 years in the prep division of the New England Conservatory. Tony Tasker is a retired physical therapist and former professor of physical therapy at Simmons College. Let's welcome them to hear about their pilgrimage. Well, I'm on first. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. It's wonderful to be here. I have really spent the last couple of years exploring what my grandfather was up to in the First World War because I really didn't have a clue. This is all I really knew about. This is a model of the propeller that was on the destroyer that he, that was named after him in 1919 and it was launched from, from Cramps, Pennsylvania and also it served quite widely in World War II. <coughs> It, was, it went uh, up and down the coast. It was in various campaigns, the one in Sicily, the one in Africa. It served after the, the First World War quite extensively. But it sat on a bookcase in our home, and I looked at it and picked it up. It was kind of heavy. But I thought, what is this? I mean, I knew what it was, but I didn't know much about it. And my father did not say much about his father. And one of the reasons may have been that my father was 10 when my grandfather died at Bella Wood, as it says here. This is the launching of the destroyer in 1919. And my father's on the right over there. And then Ted is on the left. And there's my grandmother crashing the champagne bottle on the bow. This was the first emergence for me. This is a book that my mother wrote about my grandfather. After my father died in 1987, my mother then received the letters that had come, of course, from my grandmother to my father, and she being a very creative person, and I think some of you who, who knew her from First Parish Church, where we grew up, knew just how creative she was. After my father died, she suddenly decided to take up writing. And this book was the first thing she wrote. Now, originally it was in a manuscript form, which she then sent out to all the relatives. This is a sample letter from my grandfather, who, by the way, had quite good penmanship, I think. <laughs> they were really quite readable, which was good when you're trying to transcribe them onto you know, the internet or whatever. It really was, it, this particular version, which is a hardback one, I've got one up here if you want to look at it later. Um, was something that my sister Diana Cole and I put together in order to memorialize more concretely 
this wonderful book that she wrote, and we've, we've sold several copies of it. Well, there are my parents on the right. Some of you may recognize them, Polly Cole and, and Charlie Cole, about 1966. And of course, my, my dad really knew nothing other than the basic facts of what happened to his father. So they met, they got a letter from a man named A.K. Mayer, who was a pharmacist who attended my grandfather in the field hospital. He, he uh, wrote them a letter. Of course, there wasn't the internet. It probably took 47 years for this to happen. And my parents, my parents met him in Indianapolis. He had been connected with the Lilly Pharmaceutical Company. So I was at school at Indiana University, and my parents decided to take a side trip to meet him at that time. Why I didn't go, I can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, considering how much time I've spent around my grandfather, that was a huge gap. And I might add that, nor did I ask my grandmother very much. I mean, she survived. She survived into the, into the uh, 70s. I mean, why didn't I ask her a few questions? Well, when you're a teenager, you know, sometimes you're just all wrapped up in your own things. I would like to read a segment of what <coughs> Mr. A.K. Mayer wrote. This is a letter to my dad. I will never forget Ed Cole. A braver man never lived. He knew his condition and that his chances were not good. If I don't get out of this, and I think I won't, please write to my wife and send her my few personal things. Your father trusted me to see that these things were transmitted to your mother, Mr. Mayer continued, and I felt like I was carrying out the last wish of a great soldier and father and a very devoted husband. I will never forget your father. He made a deep impression on me, and I have never forgotten and never will. Now, this relationship lasted, oh, I don't know, three or four years. They were writing each other back and forth. And the uh, <clears throat> mayor lived in the Southwest, so he was doing things like sending various dried plants for my mother to make flower arrangements out of. She <laughs> was one of her creative things. So they had, they had a relationship for a while, and I don't know whether he died, but it finally, I mean, he did, obviously, but it, finally, <laughs> it ended after a few years. <clears throat> so enter Madeline Johnson. Now Madeline is someone that I met through the internet. 2014, I received an email and it said, I found some excerpts or some references to your grandfather in my great uncle's letters, Captain Lothar R. Long. Would you be interested in seeing them? I said, yes, I think so, because by now, of course, I was a bit into it with my mother's writing and everything. So she sent me some letters, I mean, some excerpts from letters. And this is Captain Lothar. He was the intelligence officer in my grandfather's machine gun battalion, which was Machine Gun Battalion Number Six, the Sixth Machine Gun Battalion, and he wrote. Interestingly, he wrote his impressions of my grandfather. Dear Ninja, he had these various nicknames for his parents and people, but that's his mother. But all I ever accomplished while I was, while I was an intelligence officer. In fact, all I ever accomplished as an officer, I owe to my good friend, Major Cole, who was mortally wounded in the morning of June 10th when we went forward together under the rolling barrage in Bella Wood. Gee, Ninja, he was a peach, and yet he was the strictest and perhaps one of the harshest disciplinarians in the Marine Corps. With a fierce, quick temper like fire, electricity, he was a terrific worker and as jumpy, unerring, and relentless as lightning. He made decisions as quick as a flash and never backed down. He was afraid of no one. And I remember him standing right in the open, in plain view of the Bosch, only a few hundred feet away, as unheeding of the bullets snipping off the heads of the wheat and the red poppy blossoms, and crackling past his ear, and kicking up the dirt everywhere around his feet, as if he had been on a practice field problem in the morning of the Battle of the Hill 142. From the first, they knew each other at Quantico. He believed in me, helped me, took sympathetic interest in my work, and when I became an intelligence officer, he gave me all the latitude and assistance, too, in his power. So that clearly was a very close relationship, too. So to meet his grandniece was really quite a treat for me, because we had all this that we shared. 
And Madeline, being quite an expert, I must say, on World War I, much more so than I was, filled me in on a lot of things about the war and about the battle. This is the next step, because Madeline knew Gilles Lejeune, who's on the right there, and two film directors, and Antoine Pah and <clears throat> Laura Freudfong, young, as you can see, very young directors, uh, who wanted to put together the story of Gilles Lejeune. So they, I sent them my mother's book. It was in its manuscript form, but they, they, were, they were just swayed by it and thought we've got to include this somehow in this film. So they decided to do that. It took a couple of years, but then in 2016 in September, my sister Diana and I went to France to fill in that piece of the film. It took us about three days of filming that they wanted to include. This is a map, what happened to my pointer? Oh, here it is. <laughs> One of the things that I never knew anything about, but which I now do know, is where my grandfather was billeted. I mean, what, what was his path? What, where did he go? Well, I found out that he arrived at St. Nazaire, which was a common place for the troops to arrive. Uh, he went to Bosab. How do you pronounce that, Tony? Oh, Boge. Boge. Boge, thank you. <laughs> um, which was the Bourmont training area, and he was actually billeted in Germainvilliers. We didn't see those spots, and you can see on the map that they went by train all the way there. Then they went back by train just to Lem, which we did was our first stop, which I'll show you in a moment. And then they marched, or my grandfather, being an officer, rode horseback to the next area, which was the Verdun area, and they were staying in Somme Dieu. I put Fort Rosalier here because that's, it was a whole ring of forts around Verdun, and that was one of them. I'm not sure quite why we stopped there because my grandfather wasn't particularly there, but I think it was because it was on the, the property or the same area as PC <coughs> Moscow, where he was. And then, of course, they went to north of Paris briefly. We did not go there, and then the rest, Montgivreau Farm, where the officers were billeted, Bella Wood, and he's buried in the and Marn Cemetery. <clears throat> All right, here we go. This is Gilles. There he is in his World War I museum, which he has collected. He's, he's in his mid-50s. He's been picking up things around the countryside, sometimes digging them up, sometimes just finding them, for 40 years. And he, I think, in my opinion, he is the most expert person. What he cares about most is connecting things he finds with the people that they belong to, uh, and when, he, when he can, of course. But he just, he just takes tours. He takes Americans on tours all around the countryside, all the battlefields, all the places. He takes people on the footsteps of their, their grandparents or their great-grandparents, depending on their age. Uh, but he sees a wonderful man who has a great deal of knowledge. And, of course, on the right there is Gilles, my sister Diana, and Madeline. This is Lem. We stopped there just to make note of this is a place where we, they detrained before they went on to the area of, of Verdun. Um, and that's just the film crew. What's interesting is the building behind them the town hall building is actually, as you can see, there are pictures from 1918 and it's still there. I mean, and it's not particularly beat up either. Of course, it might have been repaired, who knows. So now we're in PC Moscow, which was one of the places. They had a bunch of wooden cabins scattered through the woods. And that's the remains two years ago of a dugout. Now you can't see much, it's very overgrown. Some of them, we saw another one where the, the beams had collapsed totally. But it's hard to imagine, you know, them running into these places. In fact, the picture below is something that my grandfather drew in one of his letters to describe to his two sons, Charlie and Ted, just what it was like to be escaping this shell. You can see here. <laughs> so that, that's really what, what that, that comes from. Here's the quote here. 
A short time ago, Captain Curtis and I were in our mess room eating breakfast when Bluey went a very big shell just outside our window. I got a piece of toast mixed up with a swallow of coffee in the wrong channel of my throat. And Captain Curtis, well, the last I saw him was he was easily outrunning the 9.2 shell in the direction of the duck island. <laughs> Somehow I caught up with him at the entrance and we passed in neck and neck for a dead heat. It ain't no disgrace to run when you are skeered. <laughs> These 9.2 shells are almost as tall as Teddy. So Teddy was eight at the time. The Laura, one of the directors, very kindly photographed in the spring this area in, in uh, PC Moscow where there's beautiful beds of violet-like flowers grow all over underneath the trees. And I really appreciated that because he wrote many letters in which he referenced this. And here is one to his wife. The past two weeks have been a very foggy with only a couple of pleasant days. Spring unfolds very slowly in this country. We have some pretty blue flowers in the woods. When closed, look like a violet, but when open, are round in shape. If you were here, you would have a large bunch for the table center. I think of you every time I see them, and as there are millions of them on every side, you may know that I think of you most of the time. This is uh, just to show you that we had very nice accommodations while we were on this filming tour. This is a farmhouse that was owned by the cousin of Gilles, and we had sort of farm-style meals with a huge table inside, and it was so beautiful, such beautiful weather that we were outside most of the time, and it housed all the filming crew and the three of us, and that's the view over there on the right that you could see out the, the back patio. So we had it pretty nice, and but I will say that filming like this so intensely, full days, is very exhausting, so we needed a beautiful place like that. My grandfather was by some considered the father of the machine gun, and the reason for that is he was very, very involved in developing or facilitating or putting into action the Lewis machine gun. Unfortunately, it was not used in many of the battles in France, but he developed that cart on the right as something that he designed, and there he is, he's second from the left there. Can you hear me all right? Is this okay? Yeah. yeah. He's is right here, second from the left. I'm not sure why he's in civilian clothes. Maybe he had come from something where he had to wear civilian clothes, but he's observing the soldier there with the, with the Lewis machine gun. So here we are at Wongi Roll Farm, which was the jumping off place, and they went there on June 1st, so we're getting close now to the Battle of Bella Wood. And that's what it looked like after it was bombed in 1918. It was also bombed in the Second World War. It was the command post for the 6th Battalion, and my grandfather stayed there. So now I'm getting closer and closer to seeing where he actually spent time. This is what it looks like today. And it's really crumbling apart, as you can see. And this fellow, the farmer who lived in the house right next to it, his cousins lived in this, this spot. And they decided not to flee with the exodus. And the husband drowned himself in the pond down below. And the wife hung herself rather than go in the exodus. He was quite a character. He, once he got sort of used to us, he expounded at great length about various aspects, in French, of course, so <laughs> that left me a little off to the side, but that was all right. We, we, we heard that part because it was translated for us. Shield also believes this building's going to probably be to just totally crumbling in the next year or two. <coughs> now, this is a small strip of wood that actually faces, on the right there is Bella Wood. This, where we're going to walk up there, is Verdudu Wood. And here's where the Marines set up their machine guns. Um, 
to protect the soldiers, and we know that didn't work very well when they were going across the field, <laughs> did not work very well, but they had a whole line of machine guns as they were trying to, you've probably seen pictures of them running across the fields and just being shot down right and left. Um, and there we are, of course, Madeline and Sheila and myself, film crew with crew in the distance there. Um, all right, so this is interesting because these are things that Gilles found while we were in the, these woods. He's showing on the left, he's demonstrating what it was like to, to be at a machine gun on that mound there. And then he found some ammunition and he took it apart, this bullet, and he put it down, <coughs> put a match to it, and it burst into flame. <coughs> that's 98 years after it was used. And that's a, a, a hand grenade, obviously. And that shell over there leaning against the tree, well, we decided it was a good idea not to go anywhere near that because some of these things can still be live. So this is where it gets really amazing because Gilles found the exact location, meaning the exact ravine, the, the German machine gun nest where my grandfather fell or was mortally wounded. The situation was that the, um, the Germans were in a quarry, an old quarry that had three machine guns, and they were firing across at the Americans. And in this ravine, there were various things. But you can see that, see that cross mark there, right here, that. He determined <coughs> that that's where it was on the 1918 map because the field runner had said it is 300 yards north of the word, the E, the second E in the word below. <laughs> that's how they notated that. And of course, this is a modern map. He discovered where it would be there. And with GPS and other things, he determined exactly which ravine it was, which I think is pretty incredible. So we tracked through the woods into Bellwood, and we got to, this is a foxhole that still exists. And that is sort of the remains of the quarry where Gilles is standing. Very often the filming team would say, let's just have a moment of silence. Because they were trying to pick up moments of silence to perhaps intersperse in the film. This was one of those. I just, it shows the ravine pretty well. Uh, that's what's good about it. Now, this, of course, with the machine guns, I didn't know this, but Shield informed us that a machine gun cannot tip down beyond a certain angle. You mostly go, I guess there's a limit to how much it can tip down. So it couldn't tip into the ravine. So my grandfather was in the ravine and they threw someone in the quarry, because they were getting quite close, threw a potato masher grenade. My grandfather, normally you wouldn't do this, he picked it up to try to throw it back and that's when it exploded in his hand. It took off his hand, wounded him in the face and legs. It did not he did not die right away, but he was very severely wounded. Um, so that's, it's interesting to me that that, that that was the situation. Now you might say, well, why didn't he jump out of the way? That's what you're supposed to do if a, if a hand grenade comes in. Most likely he was protecting his men or men around him, and so he thought he could throw it back. Well, the timing was, was not good. This is the, this is an old picture of the first aid station that was just at the end of that ravine you just saw, <coughs> near Lucy Lubacage, uh, lo located under a bridge. What's interesting is we actually got to that spot. There mm -hmm. it is, okay. there it is today. Yeah. It's amazing, I mean, I never would have imagined as much would be remaining, you know, as one can see from, at that point, 98 years ago. That's Lucy Lubacage. That was kind of the next stop for the wounded soldiers. And this is where my grandfather ended up, this Chateau de Mont Montauglaust in Coulomier, France. And he was there for eight days before he actually died. 
Now, if today he probably wouldn't have because he had gangrene and infection and so forth, and that's really what, what took him. <coughs> uh, and also, penicillin would have really made a big difference. They thought he was going to survive initially, but the wounds were just too bad, and they, they got infected, and that was it. On the right is my, is my great uncle, who was a brigadier general in the army, and he came and visited my grandfather. Well, they, they saw each other a few times before my grandfather was wounded, but he came and saw him in the hospital and wrote back to my grandfather, my grandmother, I mean, expecting that he might recover, but of course, unfortunately, he did not. As a point of interest, my father, Charles H. Cole II, actually one of his, he was an architect, of course I grew up in Lexington, and uh, he designed a penicillin plant as one of his jobs as an architect. Mm -hmm. Now President Wilson and the Congress had put money aside for widows and widows and uh, wives to go to these places in France. And that's my grandmother on the left. She was 52 years old at the time, traveling with her companions to France to see the battleground, to see the grave where my, my grandfather was buried. And that went on for a few years in the 30s, the early 30s. So a lot of widows and wives got to go to France and to see these places. Here she is at the, the cemetery, and she, as I say, she was 52 at the time, in 1931. And I think that's a really very touching picture of her because, you know, it's her first, I'm glad she got to go there. Um, and this is her passport for this program right here. Here we are, Diana and myself on the right here. And of course, as some of you may know, uh, they have a tradition of rubbing sand into the carving on the graves. They read, do that so you can read it more easily. But what's really interesting is the sand comes from Omaha Beach. Oh. Yeah. Now this, I put into the slideshow just yesterday. This is the bell which has recently surfaced from the destroyer that was named after my grandfather. And apparently it's, in 1945, the destroyer was decommissioned and the Navy tried to get a hold of it, but something happened, it was loaned somewhere. Anyway, it wound up, who knows where, but about a year ago it turned up in what's called American Pickers, which I guess are people oh, yeah. that go around yeah. and pick up things. It was picked up and then it was returned. Um, the destroyer, by the way, as I mentioned before, was involved with a lot of things in World War II. Uh, but it now is, the bell now is, returned to the custody of the Naval History and Heritage Command. And I think that's located in Washington. Does anyone know where that's located? I just heard this information through a relative of mine from down the other line of Coles, who's done quite a bit of research and has a way of finding stuff on the internet, <laughs> and he found this. <laughs> so this is a portrait of my grandfather in his dress uniform. And I'd just like to read something that my grandfather wrote here. All right. Um, this is from his brother, Brigadier General Charles. His act at Bella Wood was a most courageous one and was highly responsible for bringing about the capture of the German machine guns. It was an act that was not called for in his line of duty to perform because he was a machine gun officer, but he saw an opportunity, realized the necessity for it, and took it upon himself to lead the attack. 
his whole record on the front has been a wonderful one, and his machine guns have done more towards stopping the enemy on this front than any other single agency. He has been recommended for the Distinguished Service Cross, and his commanding general speaks about him in the highest of praise. He received a number of, war, of, of awards, the Croix de Guerre with Palm, the Distinguished Service Cross, and I have them all here. I think they must be on a previous slide. Uh, anyway, he, he got really everything short of the Medal of Honor, basically. And the, the uh, American Legion uh, Post 120 in Hingham is named after him. It's now a GAR post. So he's really anything around the subject of Bella Wood. He de his name definitely comes up frequently. I'm going to read one more thing. This is from a Captain Sterrett. This letter was written to my father. You can always remember your father as one of the biggest heroes of the war. He gave up his life gloriously in the battle that turned the tide and was the beginning of victory. The world is grateful for his sacrifice, which is meant for you, the loss of your dear father. I give you my sincere sympathy, but I know that you and your brother will always be comforted in the knowledge that his life was given to make the world a safe place to live in. That's Marine Corps Major T.G. Sterrett. That concludes my talk, but I would like to mention that the film that this is about, largely, is being shown in Belmont two days from now at the Belmont Town Hall at 7 p.m. And this will, I think, everyone who's seen it has been overwhelmed by how beautiful it is. Because, as I say, it's not about my grandfather. It's about Gilles and the work he does and how he connects with descendants. And it's, it's really a very beautifully done very meaningful film, and I've got some flyers over there if you're interested in that. And, of course, I would like to thank Linda Dixon and the Lexington Veterans Association for allowing me to tell this story, which has been a, a great pleasure and honor to do. I have a slow computer, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. One in, next one in. This is where it's like, I'm 
too old for this kind of technology. <laughs> okay, so now I'm in this. I'm in this one. Okay. Get there. father, Calvin Southwick, and this is a picture of him and my grandmother Antoinette, who I'm named after, um, at about the time that I was born in the 40s. So clearly my grandfather survived World War I. Part of the lore in my family was that there was a picture of a little girl on my grandfather's dresser that I always noticed through the years when we went to visit them in upstate New York. And I was curious about it, but all I heard about it was that it was a little girl that was in a family, a French farm family, that helped to take care of my grandfather when he was sick with the Spanish flu during World War I. End of story. That's all, <laughs> that's all we knew, um, and I guess that's all anybody was going to say at the time. Um, this is my grandfather at age 22 when he uh, enlisted in the army in uh, April of 1812. He was a private. He had been a uh, recent graduate of Albany Business College and was working as an insurance agent in the um, Albany area. So all these things sort of floated around my mind for many years. I was never, like Carolyn, smart enough to say, hey, Papa, can you tell me about? Um, I also knew from my father, who had been in the Marines in Iwo Jima, that it was really kind of off limits to talk about that. He did not want to discuss his time there, because I think it was pretty miserable. So about eight years ago, I looked for another excuse to go to France, which is not, um, I can get there on any excuse, believe me. Um, and I said, I would love to find the descendants of the family that took care of my grandfather. So that shouldn't be too hard. So I started asking my, um, my, my, at that time my grandparents had passed away, my uh, mother and uncle had passed away, and nobody knew anything. My, or my, my aunt that was still alive had Alzheimer's, and she said, it's really, I remember that, but I don't remember anything about it. So, um, so my cousin was the keeper of all the things in the Southwick family, so I, wrote to him and I said, Cal, do you, he's also Calvin Southwick, um, do you have anything in all these things in the trunk that might be from Papa and who that little girl was? So he looked through everything, could not find anything at all. So I thought, okay, well, you know, I am gonna keep trying some other way. So I, a second, I've lost my finder here. So I decided I'm going to go on the internet and see what I can find. And you know the internet is absolutely huge and there is no problem finding things on the internet. <laughs> um, I wrote to the National Archives in uh, Indianapolis and asked about my grandfather. And they said, we're really sorry, but all of the archives from something like uh, 1912 through the 50s, the 70s, were burned in a big warehouse fire. So there was nothing there. But you could try the New York State Archives, because that's where um, he was from. So I wrote to the New York State Archives, and I got his induction card, which tells when he was induct inducted into the Army, when he uh, returned back home and was demobilized, <coughs> what his rank was, private first class, and then all this gobbledygook about 153 depth frig, blah, blah, blah. And I had no idea, like, how do I f decipher all of this? And how would I ever find out where he was sick? And where was he during the war? So um, the next thing that I did was to start doing some research about the, the um, 
Army Expeditionary Force at the time was called. And I learned that he, that those little clues they give of uh, 153rd, et cetera, I could find, trace back that he was in the 1st Army, the 78th Division, which is the Lightning Division from troops from New York and New Jersey, um, 156 Brigade, and he was a machine gunner in the 309th Machine Gun Battalion in Company C. So I had, I had some hard and fast information to go on here. So then I thought, okay, so how do I find out more about where he was? Because I have to know where he was to figure out where this family was. So lo and behold, and you can probably find a book for any division that you want to, there's a book written about the 78th Division. And it tells you day by day, almost moment by moment, where, they, where the troops were, what battles they were in, where they were trained, all this kind of stuff. Um, so they started out at Fort Dix in New Jersey, and then went to France, went to do some training there. And they were ready for the first, uh, the first battle they were ready for was San Miguel, which was part of this offensive, the last um, couple of months of the war in the far western, northwestern part of France that Pershing had insisted that the Americans have as their own individual territory. And then I also learned that after the war was over, after armistice, there weren't very many troop ships left that hadn't already <laughs> returned to commerce. And so they, the two million troops that were in France at the time had to slowly be uh, taken back to the U.S. So he was demobilized to a, a, a town in, um, in Burgundy in France and was able to return in May of 1919. So this is the route that he followed. Um, he came in through Calais from England, I believe, and then went down to this area, Bourbon-les-Bains, where uh, they did some training with the British and then uh, went up 22 mile march, I think it was, to San Miguel, uh, which was a very quick and easy battle, um, and then worked their way slowly up to the area, um, and he was in, uh, fighting in the town of Grand Pré most of the time. And this is all in the Champagne uh, Ardennes region of, of northeastern um, France. So I needed to learn more about the flu, because I, I knew a little bit about it, knew it was a terrible thing that happened during World War I, but did not know all the details. And if you ever want, it's kind of a big book. But it has everything you could ever want to know about uh, the great influenza. And it really was the worst influenza ever we've seen in this world. Um, worse than the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. Um, so I thought if I understood a little bit more about the flu, I might be able to find a way in through that avenue as to where it was that, that he was sick. And maybe he wasn't taking care of it in a military hospital, but no, wait a second, the French farm family took care of him, so how come he wasn't in a military hospital? So the flu affected, they estimate, a third of the world's population in 1918 to 1919. The um, first wave of it hit Spain, and hence its name, the Spanish flu. And the, the peak, most virulent times of this virus were in 1918, in October of 1918. And there was a second peak in France in 1919. And you can see that since then, the, no the number of people that have died from flu is much less. I know this tails off in 2004, but we haven't had anything by a long shot to match the number of deaths through this. So I thought, okay, we got the two peaks now in October of 1918, another peak in uh, the spring of 1919. So where was he then? And um, could I figure it out that way? And by the way, why did so many young, healthy men die of this particular flu? Because normally, what you see is that the very young and the very old in traditional flus are the ones that succumb to it. But this type of virus had mutated to such a fierce um, attack on young people that their immune system just went wild. And they literally died within a few days, sometimes drowning in their own 
response in their lungs to it. There was no antibiotics at this time, so there, and there were no antivirals like today. You'd get Tamivir or something like that, and you'd be through it in a flash. Um, and certainly no flu shots that you got ahead of time. So that's why there were so many people that were young and healthy that, that died. Another reason is that you know that flu is transmitted through cough and sneeze or touching an area that someone has coughed or sneezed on. And here you are all jammed in 2,000 people in one of these ships. And it's been estimated that 20% of the, the soldiers died on their way over to Europe because of, of contracting the flu here. When you got to Europe, then you were stuffed into trains transporting a, around France. You were in uh, barracks that were in the, um, the different training areas. So um, there was, it was very easy to transmit this. So my husband and I decided, well, let's, let's go to France and let's go to the area where um, my grandfather was in battle and let's go to where he was after, um, after the armistice, because who doesn't want to go to Burgundy? So. <laughs> <laughs> so we visited the different battlefields in the, um, the area from Saint Miguel uh, across to the, the Musargon um, area. And um, it was just a you know, beautiful October visit. Um, we, um, let's see. Oh, okay, so um, we spent a week there visiting the different sites. Um, I'll show you some pictures of them in a second. And then the second week, um, I contacted the mayor of this little town called marigny le cahoué which is a population 291 right now, <laughs> and it's, it's near Dijon in Burgundy. And I contacted the mayor to see if he had anything in his records from World War One that where he might know something about a um, uh, family that might have cared for my grandfather. I noted that in the back of the, um, this wonderful book that I found in the 78th, that there was a list of people who died of disease, and that's not often found. And there were many other machine gunners from his regiment that died in that uh, second wave in 1919. So I thought, well, there's a chance that he might. If he had gotten sick during one of the battles in the north, well, you know, maybe some French farm family dragged him into their barn and took <laughs> care of him somewhere up in the north. Um, it was really hard to, to know. So um, we arranged to meet with the mayor of the town, and he sent out a, like a little wanted poster in the, in the town's um, uh, newsletter. And pretty much it says that an American family is looking for their grandfather, um, who was cared for by a family there. And if anyone has a story like this, to contact the mayor, and it will help us in, in finding him. Then there's a picture of my grandfather when he was on the uh, Sling Golden's baseball team in, in 1919 or something. Um, so we, we were start, we started in San Miguel and then worked our way north and went up to this area right here where the Americans were fighting. Um, and it was a, um, about a six week battle, I think, to take the, that area and then move up to Sedan, which was the goal, um, a little farther up here, almost on the border, um, was the goal of, uh, that Pershing had. And um, this is the town of Grand Pré as it was around World War I. And there was this, it was beautifully situated, just as, just as Carolyn had described the, the area around Bella Wood. The Germans had all the forests, they had all the, the high points there. There were plains in between that were used for farming. And the Americans had to get from point A to point B. And the Germans had spent years with trenching and all kinds of encampments and machine gun in installations. And so they were really sitting ducks as they tried to cross this area from the uh, Bois de Vosges over to this higher area. So the, the cathedral, the uh, there was a chateau that was there. The, um, this is um, uh, sort of a butte up above that had a park. Those were all full of machine gunners, uh, German machine gunners. If you've ever seen the story of the Lost Battalion or um, Private Alvin York, they were two 
famous episodes during this time. The 77th uh, Regiment and the 78th kind of spelled each other, and as so many people died during this, this um, battle, and so many people succumbed <coughs> to the flu, they were back and forth and back and forth, and regiments were split up, and they were just grabbing people wherever they could. So it was a, a little bit disorganized, to say the least. The casualties were very heavy because they could, they didn't have enough ambulances. The, um, the story was that as the soldiers came closer to their victory, the field medical services came closer to total disaster. The, the, they had very few ambulances. There was mud everywhere. So they were mired in the mud. There were traffic jams as they tried to, their, their priority was to get the supplies to the front and they would bring the guys back in the, they had to have horse-drawn wagons because the um, motor vehicles couldn't go through the mud. And apparently it was like two miles an hour moving through this. So sometimes people were brought back from the front, which may have been the case with your grandfather, Carolyn, that it took days sometimes to get them back from the front. And by then, infection and other uh, uh, wounds um, had caused their demise. So this is what Grand Pre looked like after three weeks of everything being totally destroyed. And then there were a few buildings that were still existing from then. That was in one of the previous pictures. And they um, restored the, the cathedral a little bit so that um, <coughs> the town looked a little more normal. But Many of these towns around here were never, ever restored. They just kind of plowed them under because there was so much destruction. We visited an area in the north called the Butte du Vauquois, which was a, a lovely little town at one time on top of a hill, but now all it is is a series of craters because everything was completely obliterated. And this is the Cemetery au Mont de Sous Montfaucon. Um, that has 14,000 graves that are just from this, this battle of the uh, Musargon. It was a particularly bloody one. My grandfather's battalion lost um, 5,000 men, a third of the, the battalion. Um, people were wonderful in helping us. Once you started telling the story, of why you were there and what you were looking for. I had a couple of young women crying, oh, this is such a poignant story, but people were really, really helpful. Um, and this was a few years before this became a really popular thing to do, which it is right now. Um, the, the gentleman who owned the little apartment we were renting in that area went out with us a few times to visit some of the sites. He was really excited about it as well. So we said, well, if it happened here, if he was sick here and someone cared for him here, we'll never find who this family is. So we went down to the little <coughs> town, Marini Kawe, and it's just picture perfect, typical Burgundian countryside with the little um, Charolais uh, cattle that you know dot the hillside. They're white. They're very easy to, to find. Um, and so we met with the mayor one evening, and he gave us a tour. This is Mayor Eric Squadana and a couple of the people that work with him. Um, and he gave us a tour of the town, a tour of his, the chateau. He said there were a thousand farms at the time of World War I, but only five of them exist today. Um, most of the people moved back toward the cities after the war. Um, he had copied some papers from things around World War I, but there was no information that he'd been able to find about my grandfather. He gave us a lovely reception in the Hall of Presidents with, you know, the statue of Marianne there and all the presidents along the wall. And we toasted Cure Royale to my grandfather. It was really <laughs> very French and very lovely. Um, and I had been studying some French with Karen Girondel, who's a well-known uh, French teacher here in Lexington. And she said, you got to bring a gift and you got to be able to talk. So I found in one of the stores here um, a beautiful uh, Delft-style plaque of Paul Revere's ride. And Paul Revere's father was a Frenchman. He was a Huguenot. He kicked out of France. But at any rate, he was French. And um, that, you know, I talked about the friendship that we've had through the years with General de Lafayette during the Revolution and um, also with us, the troops being together and helping each other in World War I and then again in D-Day. So it was 
Karen said it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really a, a lovely week there. This you know very nice area to visit, and I decided that I wasn't going to find out who this family was, and that if that was the case, then I decided that he was cared for here. Because what a wonderful place <laughs> to spend nine months trying to decompress after a horrible, horrible war like that. Any, any movie you ever saw about World War I is truth. It's just, it was just miserable. Probably worse for the French and the, and the British who were stuck in those trenches for years. But, um, so I said, okay, this was really nice. I feel really good that, that this is the place that cared for him. And then, a year later, my cousin calls me. Was she able to come today? No, she said she had to teach the, this afternoon. But at any rate, she called and she said, in cleaning out my mother's basement, we found a box called Skeletons in the Closet. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, that sounds intriguing. So what did you find there? And she found a card. And the card says, your little friend from France hasn't forgotten you. She um, is happy to send you from Chasse, that's a place, um, her best wishes for the new year uh, that's starting. Happy Christmas to uh, Mademoiselle, your sister, and to you. I, I s embrace you with all my little heart. And there's a name, Gabrielle Briante. So I have a place and a name, and I thought, oh, I can't believe this serendipity. And Chasse is two kilometers away from Marigny de Cahuay. Oh, yeah. So this ha absolutely had to be the place. And because it was in my grandfather's special box, then clearly I decided this is the, this is the little girl and the family. So um, then I started to say, well, how do I find the Briandais today? And I was able to find the census, which are the parish records usually kept in the Catholic churches in these little towns. And I saw that, in fact, this was done in um, 1921, that um, there was, um, I think that Jean-Louis was the grandfather, uh, Anasti, Anastasi was her grandmother, um, Marie was her aunt, Felice was her mother, and Gabrielle here. Um, so I knew, okay, so I've got a whole bunch of different names now of Briandes that I can look for. And they were farmers, and they, they had a farm in this little uh, town of Chasse. Also in the box was this picture that my cousins thought might be Gabrielle as an older woman. So um, they sent me copies of it, and um, I, I understand that they, my grandfather and she kept on a conversation because he was only six years old when he was there. So I tried to go on Ancestry.com to see if I could find something. Nothing. They don't do French genealogy. They look Canadian, but not French. Uh, so I joined a, a, a French one called Genealogie.com, you know, no surprisingly. Um, and I found one family tree that was done by someone named Virginie Bolletet. And here was the name of Gabrielle Briante, who was her grandmother. So I said, OK, I'm going to contact them. And you can do just like you can do on Facebook, a little messenger thing. You can send an email. I got nothing back after a couple weeks. So I said, OK, uh, I got this far. I'm not quitting now. So I went to whitepages.com, and I found her father, who was Jean. And there was a Jean Bolete who lived in a town that was right near Chasse. So I typed out a letter, and I sent it off to him by snail mail. And I also, yeah, I think that was what I did. And finally, I got an email back from Virginie, um, who does speak some English. And she said, yes, we are, in fact, the family. And uh, Gabrielle was my grandmother. Time for another trip to France. <laughs> <laughs> so we invited the, the um, Boletes to come for a Sunday dinner, which, you know, Sundays are the day you go and you eat for a long time and you spend a lot of time with the family that you're with. And so this is Jean, who is Gabriel's son. Um, this is Guillaume, who is his son. Virginie, who, thank goodness, apparently it was a high school project she had to do to do this genealogy thing, but thank goodness she did that. And Anique, her mother, and Pete. And 
you know, I guess I have a couple minutes. What do you make for a French family? <laughs> you know, you think, oh my God, that's a pretty high bar. So I decided I'd make an American meal. Well, what's an American meal? Anything you want. So I made this great sort of Mexican stew and cornbread <laughs> and had brownies with ice cream for dessert and I don't know what else, but they, they thought it was fabulous. Um, unfortunately, um, Jean did not have any stories about um, any of the soldiers who were billeted there. He said that his grandmother had, his mother had a very hard scrabble life before the war, after the war it was even tougher, and um, they, you know, they had a very small farm, they were poor, they raised grain and animals, <coughs> and um, she did marry before World War II, but her husband was in the first group that um, uh, fought against the Germans and he was captured and was a prisoner of war for five years. So that's probably why Jean is my age because he, there's a, a generation got skipped in there just about. One of the things that he brought along with all these wonderful delices de, de Bourgogne, all these fabulous things <laughs> to eat and drink. Um, oh, and I gave him among other things um, a little um, album of all the people in my family and I said I did a family tree and I said there are 59 and a half people here because of the care your grandmother and your great-grandmother gave because my my niece um, was pregnant at the time so 59 and a half um, and he had in his things a shaving kit from World War One that has all the pieces still there, you know, the a safety razor and all this, and he, he gave that to me to, to have um, as a memento. And he said that he remembered that there was a picture of a soldier that was in his parents' home while they were alive. Um, this is Gabrielle in her later years. She lived to 92, and apparently she was a very sweet person that everybody just loved, and my grandfather really loved this little girl, so we felt jealous of her at times when he was mad at us. <laughs> um, and we were there at the Toussaint, or All Saints Day, and we were able to put flowers on her grave, which family and other people do for people that are special to them. And this is the farm where my grandfather was because another family member still continues to run this farm. So I had found the family and the place and just had a really lovely time with this family. They were very simple people. He worked in a factory during his lifetime. His son is a truck driver. Um, but they were just so touched by having someone come from the United States to meet them and to tell them this lovely story that they really knew very little about. Well, the landlady that we had rented this apartment from was wonderful. She came and had the luncheon with us because my husband doesn't speak very good French. So she was really helpful in, in <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the truth. Um, she was really helpful in, in translating things for Pete. Um, and she, unbeknownst to me, contacted the local newspaper. So a reporter came out and he interviewed us and we were like on the front and the center of this uh, kind of like a Lexington Minute Man. So uh, you know it says we were following in the footsteps of a of our, our soldier grandfather and um, it was that was really just a delightful end to the whole story. And one of the things that my my cousin found in this box also was a. Um, a pillow cover that that has the French and American flags and um, it says Souvenir de France. And I asked Jean if if his mother might have made it, and he said, I don't know, she always did a lot of handwork. It looks like it's probably machine made, but this has also lasted the hundred years since the, uh, the time. And I decided it was a very fitting um, symbol of the memories that were the ones that my grandfather had and the ones that I now have of this French farm family who were so kind to my grandfather and, and new friends that we have right now. So thank you for letting me 
Tell the story again. I love telling it. <laughs> it is wonderful. All right. Questions? Um, we're ready. But would you please um, uh, ask your question into the microphone? Who wants to go first? Comments? You don't have to ask a question. <laughs> There's another one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's not only... Bill. It's not only ladies or women who cry. There you go. <laughs> well, I'm just that glad that so I didn't touching. cry telling it. Oh. Because it's really... Oh, I mean, my I don't, goodness, I'm not yes. surprised that those two women yeah. I was talking with in France were crying. It's a very touching story. And, and the fact that it actually came together and I met them, I just think is it's a incredible. marvelous gift. I'm glad. <laughs> Jim. Thanks for that. It was uh, great. And how did you two come together in this? I, I don't <laughs> well, I forget, but we've known each other for well, a long I, I, time. I remember. Oh, you remember? Okay. Yeah. So do I need to use the mic or not? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. uh, some of you know that Tony was a voice student of mine back when. I don't remember when exactly, but, but I think more recently I called Tony to get a reference for physical therapy. And of course, she's been a physical therapist forever as I'm a voice teacher forever. And so we got to talking and it was, what, maybe a couple of years ago perhaps? And, and we discovered that we had this common ground of having grandfathers in the First World War. So, and stories that were very totally different. So that's what started it all. I have a question. Um, during your sojourns over to France, do they, I always think of the French and the Germans of having very vigorous veterans associations. And I'm wondering, did you come across anything like that? Not specifically. Is this is this working? I don't know. Maybe not. Oh yes, very close. There we go. Um, I didn't see anything specifically, but I can tell you around the hundredth anniversary, all kinds of things have been going on. I mean, at Bellewood, all all over the, all over France, they're taking it very seriously. And of course, there was the the march on toward the Arc de Triomphe recently, where <laughs> a lot of the European leaders were were marching, and uh, you know, yes, not they all. they not all. Yes, well, I wasn't going to go go there. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, yeah, a great deal goes on, and my impression, I don't know about you, Tony, is that they have such appreciation and gratitude for what Americans have done in both the First and Second World War. It's something you really feel when you go there. I think probably, if it comes up at all, that it's really quite phenomenal. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. In every town, um, large or small, like in this little town of Marigny de Kauai, there is a big monument in the center of town to those who died during the First World War, and then many times there are names added in for wars since then. It, it was on our tour. The, the, the mayor made sure he stopped and showed us the monument there. Um, this was a few years ago, um, but still there were many, many exhibits that were starting. There were places that we visited um, that had been restored in anticipation of the, the centenaire that just happened. Um, so I think there's a lot of remembrance of um, at least their, their losses that were so heavy during their wars. Um, as far as something military, I didn't see that. But the whole country is behind it, I would say. Yeah, um, they have something one called... Sec. Um, Souvenir Français, each um, de department and each part of each department has a branch of Souvenir Français memory, French memory, and they have been doing a lot with the 100th anniversary. Okay, next. Yes, hi Tony. I um, thank you both for, for this presentation. It's been very interesting. Um, as I recall, there was a photograph that, that you noticed on the dresser of, of your Grandparents, is does that does that photograph still exist? Oh, okay. Just curious. 
I too think bad. it might have been replaced by the one of of uh, Gabrielle when she was an older uh, young young woman, I guess. Mm. Um, but no. Okay, right. Next one, right here. Hi, my name is Bill Poole. Uh, I was stationed in France uh, in Verdun uh, for two years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, every excuse I could get to go back to France, I do as well. And I, I want to say a couple of things about the French, is that um, they're wonderful people, very hospitable, uh, particularly if you're outside of Paris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like New York a little bit, I think. But I did want to say this about uh, World War I and the French. Uh, the population of France in 1939 was exactly the same as it was in 1914. An entire generation was wiped out. So you wonder why the French wanted a defensive strategy in World War II rather than the attack that they did in World War I. And we give the French a bad rap, I think, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and you know the depiction is that the French advanced to battle like and, and I think that's a terrible insult when you feel how many, over 1.4 million dead um, and uh, well over three and a half million casualties and so forth. So um, I just want to keep in mind that uh, France has, um, has suffered greatly and they've also are good friends. And when you go over there, I think you'll find that they're still our good friends. I just had a, a comment. Uh, we lived in, in France for a few years and one time we were vacationing in Normandy and there was a field of things growing, and I wanted to know what that plant was, and my husband speaks French fluently, and there was a farmer on a tractor, and so I said to David, go ask the guy what this is. So they, he determines, he tells me it was sweet potato, uh, it was uh, uh, sugar beets. And uh, so he says, oh, you're American? And he said, oh, I was a kid when the Americans came in the Normandy invention, and he, and he says to us, chewing gum, chewing gum. <laughs> the soldiers had given him chewing gum. The other thing about military uh, ideas in France, uh, we lived near where the Bastille uh, Day Parade would always start to go up the Champs-Élysées. And frankly, my impression is the most important wars to them are Napoleon and Napoleonic Wars and all the metro stops or <laughs> the battles so that Napoleon was involved in. But, uh, and it's very true, every, every small town you go in, there's a, an obelisk and there's so many names of the dead from World War I. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Okay, next one, over here. Over here. Okay, um, we lived in France in a very small village over in the East uh, for several years, and every uh, November 11th at 11 o'clock, mm -hmm. every village, Paris, and every small village, uh, well, no, they go, they gather there, and in the town hall uh, afterward, you know, you go in for wine and you talk to the mayor and, and such, but no matter, they don't have to make it a Monday. Whenever it is, it is a holiday, <laughs> and it's very important. And children are there all the time, and it was very moving. Over here. Thank you very much. I have not been to France. I don't speak French. <laughs> but I was a young person once. And you both made <laughs> comments that I'd like to comment from your youth. One was, you were too busy as a teenager with your teenage life to ask questions. And you said, you were told not to ask questions because it was painful, and you didn't. I lost my father when he was 53, and he immigrated to America to escape the pogroms in the early 20s. I didn't ask questions when I was young, not because I was too busy with my life, but because when you're young, you think the people around you will always be there. Mm -hmm. You don't think that you aren't going to have that opportunity later. And his sisters outlived him for 30 years, but my mother always said, don't ask them questions, it's too painful. They don't want questions asked. And not until they were all dead did my brother become the big genealog genealogist in the family and find out all the stories. So don't be hard on yourself. You know, <laughs> as a young person, you think that there's always tomorrow. You get, not till you're older do you realize tomorrow is today. Right. 
Thank you. That's a great comment. Just a moment. Uh, okay. Miss, Miss. Steve? Wait, wait. Ladies, I, I just wanted to ask a question about the soldier that enlisted in the Army in 1912. Was, was he just serving a hitch and then recalled for the war, or was it continuous his service from 1912 on? My grandfather enlisted in um, 1918. And he, he enlisted to help with the war effort. And when the war was over, he went back to his life as, um, as an insurance agent. My grandfather uh, enlisted in 1904 and went through officer's training. So he, he had 14 years before he was mortally wounded that he was in various conflicts around the world. I mean, he, he took his family to the Philippines, for example, uh, and Mexico, he was part of that. I mean, so he was in a number of, of conflicts, nothing like World War I, but I mean, he was out there as an officer for a number of years. Thank you. I just have a quick question. This was fantastic uh, for Carolyn uh, about the film. Um, do you know if it will be available, for example, on Netflix? Um, or in some of the, it, you know, for people who cannot go this uh, way. Of course, it, it was produced in France, so it's in French for the most part, except when we speak, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but it's translated from the French. Uh, you can, if you're interested, you can order a copy of it. I have, a con I have the person to contact if you want to order a copy. I'm not sure how much it costs, but, but that's a possibility to do that, if, if you'd like to see it. and. Uh, there may be some other opportunities that I will create to show it. Who knows? <laughs> I just want to add, I, I made a little list here that I'll uncover in one sec, of um, the resources that I used to discover. Because if it weren't for all these websites that I could go to, I wouldn't know anything. Um, so you may have someone that you want to find out about. I found out about my friend's um, great uncle who was British and she actually was able to visit where he was in this very small cemetery in France and then where he was permanently interred in another cemetery in France so it is possible believe me this took a lot of years of work and my husband will tell you if I get a bee in my bonnet I do not give up so I just kept <laughs> working and working and working, and working. so it was a, you have to really want to do this um, or maybe you just want to go back to France again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Not only... Oh, Could I, yeah, I just want to say one other thing. I think you can hear me. Um, no, when the button. bells were all ringing, uh, on, uh, when the bells were all ringing and we were standing silently and so forth, and I met this young person, and I said, you know why the bells are chiming? And he said, yeah, bells chime. <laughs> and I said, no. I said, you know, this is the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. On the 11th hour, 11th month, 11th day, and so forth. And he says, oh, that's why they released the latest dragon thing on 11, 11, 11. Well, thank you, not only for your questions, but for sharing your experiences. It, it made for a wonderful conversation. Thank you to you, audience, Thank you to Carolyn and Tony for a wonderful program.